Ladies and gentlemen, Mayor Don Iverson. Thank you. I haven't even said anything yet. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you all so very much for that. Thank you, Simon, for that introduction. Madam Premier, Deputy Premier, Honorable Ministers, elected officials, my City Council colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it is really an honor and a pleasure to be with you at my inaugural State of the City. It's an added honor to be joined by 11 out of 12 of my city council colleagues, and I'll give the 12th one a hard time later, as well as many other elected officials from our region, from the province. I'm sorry we did this to you on uh, trade deadline day, but we didn't look that, we didn't check the dates. So I specifically, though, want to acknowledge and thank Premier Redford and Deputy Premier Hancock for taking the time to be here. I understand, Madam Premier, that this is your first state of the city in Alberta's capital city, and we are very appreciative of your presence. You know, Elder Gilman Cardinal's blessing is a poignant reminder that Edmonton has been a gathering place for a very long time. At least 8,000 years before the arrival of Europeans, this spot, which we now call Edmonton, perched on the North Saskatchewan River, has been a pehonan, or gathering place, and the focal point of ceremony and trade for indigenous peoples. This remains a place, a magnet, for people coming here to build something enduring together, be it a future, a family, a business, or a work of art. Great cities emerge as Edmonton is now emerging when enough of us and enough infrastructure and enough investment and enough creativity and enough drive all swirl together, reaching a kind of critical mass. Ladies and gentlemen, a new, more confident Edmonton has emerged. Building upon our rich heritage, leveraging our advantages, and most importantly, unafraid to challenge ourselves to do even better. You know, every day I am reminded that Edmontonians are the real city builders in Edmonton. In the businesses they run, the services they provide, and the time they volunteer. City Council and our 11,000 colleagues work hard to support you in building the city we all aspire to. A city that welcomes newcomers and cares for the less fortunate. A public transportation system that moves a growing population efficiently. Infrastructure to support a fast-growing city's needs. An urban core and gathering place to showcase Edmonton. Being unafraid to challenge ourselves to do even better requires innovation at City Hall, in business, and in the community. For example, our transportation department is partnering with the University of Alberta to study pavement material and roadway management in winter cities. This partnership will help us make better planning and paving decisions in the future. We know the city can do better with its public engagement. We must connect with our public more effectively Clearly, our processes have to be better and more transparent. We are making progress at gathering the input of citizens early on before options or decisions are developed. Open government must be more than a catchphrase. It's an attitude adjustment and one that I will continue to lead. With the city center airport now closed, 
we have the opportunity to show leadership and innovation with the Blatchford development, offering a walkable, transit-oriented lifestyle option to families that is scarce in Edmonton in a community that meets high environmental standards. In this neighborhood, and in many others, we must enable infill and more housing choices for Edmonton families. Meanwhile, world markets demand cleaner, greener, cheaper, faster, and safer ways of doing businesses. And our entrepreneurs and researchers and innovators can show the world how. We must, if we are to stay relevant, we have shown that we can keep up. Having a strong post-secondary institutions, being the logistical hub and gateway to the world's politically safest energy reserves, and investing in an internationally recognized business incubator that is second to none in Canada, and by enabling an unprecedented level of investment and confidence in downtown's renaissance, anchored by Rogers Place. The country, and indeed the world, are taking note of what's happening in Edmonton. From sovereign wealth funds to venture capitalists, they like what they're seeing. Edmonton, an economic powerhouse, is now poised to take its rightful place as one of Canada's premier cities. Our city, our region, and our north, we together are key to Edmonton's future and prosperity and competitive edge. Yes, we are living through remarkable economic times. You've all heard it. Among the fastest job growth of large municipalities, more jobs than people to fill them, healthy housing starts, strong migration into our city and region from within Canada and around the world. Bottom line, our economic fundamentals are strong. However, I will not let us become complacent. Though our city has benefited from these extraordinary economic times, prosperity has not reached all Edmontonians. Over 100,000 of us live in poverty, including almost 30,000 children. This is a reality that threatens our future and cannot go unaddressed. I'm glad you agree. Those living in poverty are disproportionately immigrants and indigenous women. Many are women often, leading to, uh, often struggling to lead single parent households. They are our friends, they are our co-workers, they are our neighbors. And if our neighbors are not thriving, then neither are we. Simply managing poverty is not working. It's costing us billions in health care and in lost productivity. And it's costing many children their promising futures through no fault of their own. It costs us in policing when those in poverty turn frustration and desperation into antisocial behavior. It costs us when children too hungry to learn fail to get the skills they need to succeed and be productive members of the community. Poverty is complex. Its causes are multifaceted, interlinked, and anything but straightforward. Many are afraid to tackle it, but I am not. <laughs> City Council has already been at work on a long-term poverty elimination strategy. The focus so far has been on shifting from a charity model to one based on investment. Recognizing the work that's already been done, I will elevate the profile of poverty elimination by bringing the weight of the Mayor's office. Next week, Council will consider my proposal to create a mayor's task force that I will co-chair personally with members drawn from business, from faith communities, and subject matter experts, with the mandate of crafting real-world strategies to significantly reduce poverty among our neighbours. Realistically, the work may take a generation, but progress towards poverty elimination will benefit all Edmontonians, and our work, if it is to be successful, must align with our Premier's own courageous commitment to eliminating child poverty in Alberta. <clears throat> and
And as we start this dialogue, I invite you to think about what providing a living wage can do for workers. Consider how supporting child care for your staff will lessen their day-to-day -day worries and enable them to be better, more productive workers. Think about, as members of Canada's largest chamber of commerce, how you can help to unleash the next generation of entrepreneurs from unlikely circumstances. You know, we compete in a world that has never been flatter, facing constant pressure to remain competitive day in, day out. Our economy is firing on all cylinders. In fact, the Conference Board of Canada forecasts the Edmonton metropolitan area to be among Canada's fastest growing in the coming years. However, if we are to be a truly effective region of 1.2 million people, our shared future and success is conditional on functional relationships with neighboring municipalities. If we want to continue to outperform other city regions in Canada, then we must work together much more effectively, and there can be no delay. Earlier this year, uh, as James alluded to, um, he called for two things. One was a study on amalgamation, which I think actually overshadowed his other important point. The other thing the Chamber called for, quite rightly, were stronger results from the Capital Region Board. Specifically, meaningful regional collaboration on economic development and working together on regional infrastructure planning. Well, I don't... Sure. <laughs> While I don't see amalgamation on the horizon, I know there is real frustration among business leaders like you about the state of the region, and I share it. If the Capital Region Board cannot demonstrate results, voices calling for more radical change will drown out diplomacy. If we or our neighbors see this as playing for keeps, we will all lose in the end. That's the pathway to lost investment, and lost opportunity, and the pathway most likely to end with forced amalgamation. Rather than the negotiated mutual benefit we should strive toward together. To that end, I have been asking my fellow mayors in the Edmonton region to renew their commitment and efforts so that we as a region can rise above our differences and deliberate in an open and candid manner and ensure that the entire Edmonton region succeeds. For the region to achieve results, we must work together much more effectively on economic development. The region must deliver an updated growth management plan next year with elevated standards for density and urban growth and accountability to those standards. The plan should reinforce the importance of growing existing communities rather than starting new ones. Boundary changes are a natural part of these discussions, hence the city's pursuit of annexation. Edmonton's boundaries have not changed since 1982. Calgary's have changed more than a dozen in that same period. Naturally, negotiation is part of the annexation process. However, we cannot accept only new residential growth. Edmonton's future growth must be balanced with a healthy mix of residential and employment areas. Our cities very future and competitiveness make that our region's future and competitiveness are at stake. So I put it to my fellow mayors, what will you do differently? How will you think differently? Are you ready to look ahead and ensure that our region's ability to compete globally for our mutual long-term benefit is always at the forefront of our deliberations? An essential part of being competitive is the ability to move people and goods efficiently. When Edmonton's LRT system came online in 1978, it was a notable achievement for a city of our size, one heard around the world. Beginning with the vision of council under the leadership of former Mayor Mandel, we once more have momentum on our side. A fully built out LRT network is an efficient, an effective way to meet the, to meet the needs and demands of one of Canada's fastest growing metropolitan areas. It enables the city and region to continue to be a gathering place for trade and commerce. 
We heard it loudly last fall and continue to hear sustained support from Edmontonians for the expansion of our LRT system. Past councils were not always clear on their priorities. To remove all doubt, this council unanimously declared LRT expansion as its priority for new investment in infrastructure, beginning with the long-awaited Valley Line from Millwoods to downtown. You may have caught coverage of my meetings with federal cabinet ministers and other elected officials in Ottawa last week, Social Development Minister Kenny, Industry Minister Moore, Transport Minister Raitt, Health Minister Ambrose, and Minister of State for Finance Sorensen, as well as Edmonton MPs. I stressed with them the critical role that Edmonton and Northern Alberta already play and will continue to play in the national economy and emphasize the importance of mass transit to our growing city and region, messages which were well received and also conveyed in national media. And at this point, I'd like to specifically acknowledge Edmonton Economic Development, the Edmonton Chamber of Commerce, Startup Edmonton, and the Urban Development Institute for their strong letter of support for Edmonton's LRT expansion. It's wonderful to have the business community united behind us in this cause. The Edmonton region accounts for close to one-third of Alberta's population. As an anchor of one of the most dynamic economic development corridors anywhere, our region's $81 billion gross domestic product is almost 30% of the provincial economy. Clearly, big cities are the economic engines of the province and the country. To be globally competitive, we need the federal and provincial government's sustained commitment to rapid transit now more than ever. We, in Alberta, have an opportunity to move ahead, learning from the lessons of other congested Canadian cities and staying ahead of the rapid growth that we all know is coming and that will fundamentally alter our province's landscape. Madam Premier, never has the opportunity and the timing to fully build out Edmonton's network of LRT been more worthy of your government's leadership, commitment and support. Show you understand the needs of this city in the same way that my council does. Show Alberta's capital city that we are worth investing in. Monday's speech from the throne has given us much to hope for, and we look forward to tomorrow's budget. You know, in a similar vein, big cities fuel a large part of the province's economic dynamism. In fact, Edmonton and Calgary, with over half of Alberta's population now, account for more than 60% of its economic output. We've been working with the province on a more equitable approach to how big cities are recognized. And we appreciate that Minister Hughes is with us here today, the Minister of Municipal Affairs as well. Currently, Canadian cities bear the responsibility for 60% of public infrastructure, and we do it with 8% of the tax revenue. The City of Edmonton provides services to our citizens and many in the region that include complex cross-border policing, library, literacy and educational support services, international trade and investment attraction, domestic violence reduction, social and affordable housing, newcomer settlement, and preventative health care with recreation and active transportation. Edmonton's continued reliance on the existing legislative and fiscal framework is holding us back from the optimal delivery of services to citizens and will continue to be a hindrance. We have reached the point where Alberta's big cities have outgrown the one-size-fits-all municipal government act and our collective efforts are better spent focused on a big city charter. What is needed is a real partnership between Alberta's big cities and our provincial government. And we've been working closely with the City of Calgary and I'm happy to report that we are closely aligned on our vision of what a big city charter means. And what we heard in this week's speech from the throne is very encouraging. 
And I look forward to working with Minister Hughes and with you, Madam Premier, and I hope and expect that our dialogue will be productive, reconciling the roles of our governments and our responsibilities to our citizens. And while the revenue conversation is essential, I have not prejudged a single outcome. The mature relationship that can grow from this big city charter work is absolutely essential to Edmonton's continued progress. Progress takes many forms. One of them is reconciling our past. We are humbled that Edmonton is the final stop of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada later this month. No other province was home to more residential schools. But what this tragic period of our history has demonstrated above all is the resilience of our Indigenous peoples in spite of systematic attempts to strip their culture, traditions and language. This is a truth we must come to terms with. The gathering of survivors' testimonials and statements will be powerful, emotional, and for many of us, uneasy. While it will not undo the hurt and wrongs of the past, the retelling and chronicling of this episode in our history is an opportunity for us as a people to learn from it and recommit ourselves to building a better and more inclusive city to engage more meaningfully with Canada's soon-to-be largest urban Indigenous population. In fact, the commission, the commission stop in Edmonton is a one-of-a-kind opportunity for us all to join in conversations around truth and reconciliation. Elsewhere in the country, non-Indigenous Canadians turned out in full force as one in a gesture of reconciliation to learn about the injustice of residential schools and to underline the fact that healing is a shared act. Without recognizing our shared history and learning from it, we have no hope of making change. This gathering place we call home is made up of entrepreneurs, teachers, students, artists, tradespeople, caregivers, seniors, those who help and those who need our help. A city binds our diverse interests, gives us a shared purpose, and makes us stronger. It's our job now to take this remarkable moment in history and meet these defining challenges head on as one. Building critical infrastructure, tackling poverty, unleashing innovation, that's why we have chosen to gather here, to do great things. My responsibility and my council colleagues' responsibility is to steer us, focused, on an ascendant Edmonton. Great cities emerge when conditions are ripe for unprecedented cooperation, creativity, and disruptive change. The cities that embrace this will thrive, while cities that are content with today will lag and wither. I will not stand for that, and given what we hear from talking to Edmontonians every day, Neither will you. Thank you.